the night. I am prepared for anything with my rubber gloves ready, if necessary, to start carving a local cow at the drop of a hat in the style of James Herriot. Actually, I might not wear these gloves all evening because they're very rubbery and noisy and not really that easy to put on and off. However, welcome to my special live bibliotherapy session tonight, which is all about vets in literature and what they get up to and why it is that we love them so much. What has made over 60 million copies of James Herriot's amazing novels sell, for instance? And James Herriot is not the only vet that we love in literature. Hi, Ollie. It's great to see you here this evening. Thanks for joining me. And I wonder if you have any favourite vets in literature. On my researches for this topic, I did discover that actually there are fewer vets in literature than I initially imagined. I think the fact that James Herriot's All Creatures Great and Small are so incredibly successful made me think that vets would be abounding through the pages of novels, ancient and modern. But no, vets are actually fairly few and far between compared to doctors. There's a huge number of doctors in literature and I'm going to save that for another session in the future. So I am going to start with talking about the immense popularity of James Herriot because he really is such a phenomenon and he is responsible for converting so many people to becoming vets through the power of his wonderful series of novels of which he wrote eight and I am calling them novels because although some people see them as being memoirs they are actually uh, apparently at least 50% fiction so I would say they're very much novels and also they're written like novels they're brilliantly composed and structured and they're very clearly fiction. Ollie in my reading nook tonight, I have a wolf who is my veterinary companion for the night. I thought that the wolf might need a bit of medical attention because actually his eyes are looking really poorly. I'll just show you as I think we don't have that many people watching at the moment. Um, this poor wolf actually belongs to my daughter and he's a very cuddly, lovely, big gorgeous wolf but I'm afraid to say he looks really sinister because our dog actually managed to chew him um, which is very sad so he's quite a lot the worst for wear I'd, as you can see I also have a cuddly dog behind me as well to give us a slightly more benign animal presence this evening and I haven't brought the real dog up because the dog's not allowed upstairs uh, very sadly. So one of the reasons that I discovered, I rediscovered James Herriot was because I was visiting my parents' house and when I was there I came across this lovely collection of the James Herriot novels which I remember reading as a child and very much loving I also used to watch all of the TV programmes with my parents, which were out in the 1970s. And I'm sure that many of the UK listeners tonight would have watched those programmes too, um, if you were around at that time. Um, I know that there are some younger viewers that won't have had that joy. But there's actually been various new series since since then. There's a new series of All Creatures Great and Small available right now, which was only made last year, I do believe, and which I think there's another series being created at the moment. So I just want to start by reading you a little bit about 
uh, the experience of reading all creatures great and small because that's a, a something that I very much related to and this Amazon reviewer captured it really brilliantly in the way that they describe reading uh, James Herriot. Ollie, you said your dog also chews your daughter's soft pet toys. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry to hear that. It's very difficult for them not to because I think they see it as their toy and they just completely destroy it if you don't let them. Um, but yes, I'm glad that you can relate to that. So this Amazon reviewer, whose name is Judy Mercer, puts it really beautifully, the, um, the description of how she felt when reading all Creatures Great and Small by James Herriot, the pen name. Uh, she says, as I have been having a very difficult time just lately, I have bad depression with anxiety, but I'm being treated. I felt that an absorbing read might help. And then I remembered James Herriot. I had read some of his books many years ago. And when the thought came back to my mind, and I found the listing for the set of eight books, I immediately ordered it, and I'm so glad that I did. Right from the very first pages, James painted such wonderful, thoughtful pictures of firstly Yorkshire and the landscapes of the fells and farms, then the farmers and their families, together with the antics of the animals, that I was almost there with him. The many amusing and distracting stories of his trials and tribulations in the beautiful surroundings, with cold winds and even colder cobbles, immediately took me away. I could hear the sheep and the cows and the pigs. And I was, it felt like I was just sitting there with him and enjoying all those wonderful tastes. She mentions the fantastic food as well that he eats. His love of his life, of his job, his wife and his children, his pets and his partner, Siegfried and Tristan, is all so plain to see that I could really feel it through his words. His sheer delight at managing to deliver new lambs, calves and piglets was so infectious that you didn't notice all the not so appealing results as he looks in complete wonder at all of the new little ones he's helped into the world. His sheer joy is totally enclosing and has helped me through many not so happy hours. I would certainly recommend everyone to read these books if like me you're having difficult times or if you need a lot of peace, joy, and above all, a little love in your life, you will find it in the company of the Yorkshire veterinary, James Harriet. Um, hi, David and Estelle, lovely to see you this evening. Hi, Ruth, and hi, Helen. Great to have you joining me. I've realised that my room is looking a bit messy, so I'm just trying to adjust that angle. Sorry about that. Um, so that review from an Amazon reviewer, Judy Mercer, about the experience of reading the James Herriot books is bibliotherapy in action, if ever I saw it, because she says that she felt depressed, needed something to be a bit uplifting and deliberately turned to All Creatures Great and Small, knowing that those books were going to be the medicine that she needed. So she was very brilliantly self-medicating with the fantastic novels um, written about being a vet in the Yorkshire Dales. And without further ado, I'm going to read you a passage from All Creatures Great and Small. So this is one of the books that I found in my parents' bookshelves, which goes back a long way. We definitely had these books in the 1970s and as you can see the pages are yellowed and they have been well thumbed by I think our whole family actually read them. So I'm going to read you the very beginning of the first book and then I'll tell you a bit about how uh, the author came to write them. They didn't say anything about this in the books, I thought, as the snow blew in through the gaping doorway and settled on my na naked back. I lay face down on the cobbled floor in a pool of nameless muck, my arm deep inside the straining cow. 
my feet scrabbling for a toehold between the stones. I was stripped to the waist and the snow mingled with the dirt and the dried blood on my body. I could see nothing outside the circle of flickering light thrown by the smoky oil lamp which the farmer held over me. No, there wasn't a word in the books about searching for your ropes and instruments in the shadows, about trying to keep clean in a half bucket of tepid water, about the cobbles digging into your chest, nor about the slow numbing of the arms, the creeping paralysis of the muscles as the fingers tried to work against the cow's powerful, expulsive efforts. There was no mention anywhere of the gradual exhaustion, the feeling of futility and the little far off voice of panic. My mind went back to that picture in the obstetrics book. A cow standing in the middle of a gleaming floor while a sleek veterinary surgeon in a spotless parturition overall inserted his arm to a polite distance. He was relaxed and smiling. The farmer and his helpers were smiling. Even the cow was smiling. There was no dirt or blood or sweat anywhere. That man in the picture had just finished an excellent lunch and had moved next door to do a bit of carving. Just for the sheer pleasure of it, as a kind of dessert. He hadn't crawled shivering from his bed at two o'clock in the morning and bumped over 12 miles of frozen snow, staring sleepily ahead till the lonely farm showed in the headlights. He hadn't climbed half a mile of white fellside to the doorless barn where his patient lay. I tried to wriggle my way an extra inch inside the cow. He's definitely wearing a rubber glove a bit like this, I think. The calf's head was back and I was painfully pushing a thin looped rope towards its lower jaw with my fingertips. All the time my arm was being squeezed between the calf and the bony pelvis. With every straining effort from the cow, the pressure became almost unbearable. Then she would relax and I would push the rope another inch. I wondered how long I would be able to keep this up. If I didn't snare that jaw soon, I'd never get the calf away. I groaned, set my teeth and reached forward again. Another little flurry of snow blew in and I could almost hear the flakes sizzling on my sweating back. There was sweat on my forehead too and it trickled into my eyes as I pushed. There is always a time at a bad carving when you begin to wonder if you will ever win the battle. I had reached this stage. Little speeches began to flit through my brain. Perhaps it would be better to slaughter the cow. Her pelvis is so small and narrow that I can't see a calf coming through. Or, she's a good fat animal and really of the beef type, so you don't think it would pay you better to get the butcher. Or perhaps, this is a very bad presentation. In a roomy cow, it would be simple enough to bring the head round, but in this case, it is almost impossible. Of course, I could have delivered the calf by embryotomy, by passing a wire over the neck and sawing off the head. So many of these occasions ended with the floor strewn with heads, legs, heaps of intestines. There were thick textbooks devoted to the countless ways you could cut up a calf. But none of it was any good here, because this calf was alive. At my furthest stretch, I had got my finger as far as the commissure of the mouth and had been startled by a twitch of the little creature's tongue. It was unexpected because calves in this position are usually dead, asphyxiated by the acute flexion of the neck and the pressure of the dam's powerful contractions. But this one had a spark of life in it, and if it came out, it would be have to be in one piece. I bent over to my bucket of water, cold now and bloody, and silently soaked my arms. Then I lay down, again feeling the cobbles harder than ever against my chest. I worked my toes between the stones, shook the sweat from my eyes, and for the hundredth time thrust an arm that felt like spaghetti into the cow alongside the little dry legs of the calf, like sandpaper tearing against my flesh, then to the bend in the neck and so to the ear, and then, agonisingly, along the side of the face towards the lower jaw, which had become my major goal in life. It was incredible that I had been doing this for nearly two hours, fighting as my strength ebbed to push a little noose around that jaw. I had tried everything else, 
repelling a leg, gentle traction with a blunt hook in the eye socket, but I was back to the noose. Isn't that a brilliant start to a book? We are immediately desperately rooting for that poor calf to be born. We also feel James Herriot's pain and agony as he's up to his shoulder almost inside the cow and he's got a freezing back and yet he's sweating. We're completely there. We can smell the smells, see the muck, feel the sense of possible doom coming along and it's absolutely gripping. I think one of the reasons that we love to read about vets is that intense animal vivid sense of life and death and being at the brink of uh, something potentially life-changing at every moment. There's an amazing sense of something incredible about to happen all the time. The fact that an animal might die, the vet himself is actually at a very risky position with his arm being like spaghetti inside the cow's stomach. It's being, it, his arm is being, is feeling the contractions and could actually break if he moves the wrong way. And it's incredibly intimate, intense and personal. And as you read more of the stories throughout these books, uh, the narrator is constantly mentioning the fact that he's on the brink of disaster, that every time you feel like you have a success, as a vet, you could just as easily have a complete disaster and you can never feel as if you are completely um, on top of things because things are going to change all the time. So James Herriot was actually James Alfred White, uh, born in 1916, died in 1995, uh, but he did become better known through his pen, pen name, James Harriet, He was born in Sunderland, graduated from Glasgow Veterinary College in 1939 and returned to England to become a surgeon in Yorkshire, where he practised for almost 50 years. And despite the fame of his books, which was immense, he always remained a vet. He never wanted to rest on his laurels, even though he ended up leaving a huge fortune for his family. He continued working uh, almost until he died. There's also been several, as well as his books, which he started writing when he was in his 50s and ended up selling 60 million copies. There's also been various film adaptations and BBC adaptations. There was a film in 1975, All Creatures Great and Small, there was the BBC series of the same name, which ran 90 episodes, would you believe it? And there's now the 2020 TV series of the same name. So he did have amazing success with his writing. It all began at age 12 when he read an article in the Meccano magazine about veterinary surgeons. And he was captivated with the idea of having a career working with sick animals. He had spent much of his childhood walking dogs uh, around the hills of Scotland and he had a very close relationship with his dogs and he felt like it would be a wonderful thing to work with animals. And that's why he then trained to become a vet, which he did and successfully graduated to start working at a practice in Firth in the Yorkshire Dales, uh, which was in the, in the 1930s when he started. Um, he actually ended up enlisting in the RAF in 1942. And he does write about his experiences in the um, army flying in one of his books, which is Vets Might Fly. Um, but throughout all his books, he writes about his veterinary practice as well. There's a fantastic memoir written by his son, who's called Alf White, James White's son, 
who published a memoir called The Real James Herriot, a memoir of my father. And in that memoir, he portrays his father as a modest, down-to-earth, generous man, utterly unchanged by fame, a private individual who bottled up his emotions, which actually led to a nervous breakdown and electroshock, th electroshock therapy in 1960. So he did put a huge amount of his emotions and uh, imagination into his novels. He he didn't see himself as necessarily being a brilliant writer, but he actually spent a lot of time reading novels of people like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in order to find how to be a better writer. And although he claims that he didn't really start writing until his 50s, he did apparently keep very detailed diaries from when he was a young boy and throughout his whole veterinary practice. And he started writing stories in his 40s, which he began sending to many publications in the hope of getting published. And he was pretty relentless in his attempts to get published. He did eventually manage to publish his first novel, um, which was the first one of his All Creatures Great and Small books in the UK. But it wasn't until it was published in America that he achieved major success with his books. Uh, and it was the American market that began his remarkable success. He wrote his first book in 1969, If Only They Could Talk, which was a collection of stories centred around his experiences as a young vet. And that was published first in 1970. The sales were at first slow and not really happening, but it was the St. Martin's Press in New York City that really got it going when they arranged to, to publish uh, both books, which were If Only They Should Talk and It Shouldn't Happen to a Vet, as one volume. And they were what really got his huge success going, which then turned into the TV series, which everyone was watching in the 1970s, and that obviously fed back into the success of the books. So as Ollie said, it is an amazing and mesmerising story of passion for animals. And this is what comes through in his writing. And this is what made him, I think, such a great success, that he has such a passion for his animals, also for the humans surrounding him because he really captures their idiosyncrasies and their foibles. So, for instance, um, the two characters, the two brothers, uh, who are Tristan and Siegfried, were based on real brothers who apparently were even more um, hilarious and eccentric than they're portrayed in the books. And although... Um, Jim Wright, James Harriet, wrote the books uh, with quite a strong dose of fiction. The real two brothers were quite offended when they first came out. However, uh, the real James Harriet did manage to continue working successfully with those two brothers for the whole time that they shared a practice, which was many years. So... He was obviously, as well as being a brilliant writer, he was obviously quite a fantastic diplomat. So the characters in the book are obviously the key character, James Harriet, who is the vet, who has all sorts of fantastic animal adventures in the Yorkshire Dales. He meets all kind of very brusque characters who at first treat him as if he is a bit of an idiot and clearly doesn't know what he's talking about uh, as when he begins as a young vet only just graduated from vet school and gradually he wins them over with his charm and his knowledge but then there's also the fantastic animal characters um, including the wonderful dog Tricky Woo 
who is a fantastically pampered and spoilt dog. But everyone agrees when talking about these books that one of the things that makes them so fantastic is the way he captures the real characters of the Yorkshire Dales, so the men and women that live there. And he completely captures a time, the 1930s and 40s, which is obviously now far gone. But uh, we feel very vividly as if we are actually there because he talks about it so brilliantly. So I'm going to read you maybe a couple more passages if we've got time, though there are some other books that I want to talk about too, other vets in literature. And by the way, anyone that has joined tonight, do you have any great vets in literature that you can talk about? So far, most of the people that have responded to that question have mentioned vets in movies rather than in novels. I'm going to read you a little bit about the lovely dog, Tricky Woo, who's a big character in all of the novels. As autumn wore into winter and the high tops were streaked with the first snows, the discomforts of practice in the Dales began to make themselves felt. Driving for hours with frozen feet, climbing to the high barns in biting winds which seared and flattened the wiry hill grass. The interminable stripping off in drafty buildings and the washing of hands and chest in buckets of cold water, using scrubbing soap and often a piece of sacking for a towel. I really found out the meaning of chapped hands. When there was a rush of work, my hands were never quite dry and the little red fissures crept up almost to my elbows. This was when some animal work, sorry, some small animal work, came as a blessed relief. To step out of the rough, hard routine for a while. To walk into a warm drawing room instead of a cow house and tackle something less formidable than a horse or a bull. And among all those comfortable drawing rooms, there was none so beguiling as Mrs Pumphrey's. Mrs Pumphrey was an elderly widow. Her late husband, a beer baron, whose breweries and pubs were scattered widely over the broad bosom of Yorkshire, had left her a vast fortune and a beautiful house on the outskirts of Darrowby. Here she lived with a large staff of servants, a gardener, a chauffeur and Tricky Woo. Tricky Woo was a Pekingese and the apple of his mistress's eye. Standing now in the magnificent doorway, I furtively rubbed the toes of my shoes on the backs of my trousers and blew on my cold hands. I could almost see the deep armchair drawn close to the leaping flames, the tray of cocktail biscuits and bottle of excellent sherry. Because of the sherry, I was always careful to time my visits for half an hour before lunch. A maid answered my ring, beaming on me as an honoured guest and led me to the room, crammed with expensive furniture and littered with glossy magazines and the latest novels. Mrs Pumphrey, in the high-backed chair by the fire, put down her book with a cry of delight. Tricky! Tricky! Here is your Uncle Harriet! I had been made an uncle very early and, sensing the advantages of the relationship, had made no objection. Tricky, as always, bounded from his cushion, leaped onto the back of the sofa and put his paws on my shoulders. He then licked my face thoroughly before retiring, exhausted. He was soon exhausted because he was given roughly twice the amount of food needed for a dog of his size. And it was the wrong kind of food. Oh, Mr Harriet, Mrs Pumphrey said, looking at her pet anxiously. I'm so glad you've come. Tricky has gone flop bot again. This ailment, not to be found in any textbook, was her way of describing the symptoms of Tricky's impacted anal glands. When the glands filled up, he showed discomfort by sitting down suddenly in mid-walk and his mistress would rush to the phone in great agitation. Mr Harriet, please come. He's going flop bot again. I hoisted the little dog on a table and by pressure on the anus with a pad of cotton wool, I evacuated the glands. I wonder if he had his gloves on. It baffled me that the peak was always so pleased to see me. Any dog who could still, like a man, 
who grabbed, sorry, who could still like a man who grabbed him and squeezed his bottom hard every time they met, had to have an incredibly forgiving nature. But Tricky never showed any resentment. In fact, he was an outstandingly equable little animal, bursting with intelligence, and I was genuinely attached to him. It was a pleasure to be his personal physician. The squeezing over, I lifted my patient from the table, noticing the increased weight, the padding of extra flesh over the ribs. You know, Mrs Pumphrey, you're overfeeding him again. Didn't I tell you you're to cut out all those pieces of cake and give him more protein? Oh yes, Mrs Harriet, Mr Harriet, Mrs Pumphrey wailed. But what can I do? He's so tired of chicken. I shrugged. It was hopeless. I allowed the maid to lead me to the palatial bathroom, where I always performed a ritual hand washing after the operation. It was a huge room with a fully stocked dressing table, massive green ware and rows of glass shelves, laden with toilet preparations. My private guest towel was laid out next to the slab of expensive soap. I won't go on, but you get the impression of the wonderful Mrs Pumphrey and the fabulous Tricky Woo. And later on, uh, Mrs Pumphrey also acquires a piglet called Nugent, who is also a fabulous character. And James Harriet becomes Nugent's um, uncle as well. And the reason that James Harriet loves being an uncle is Mrs. Pumphrey constantly sends him gifts of wonderful foods and drinks every time there's anything to celebrate. And considering that most of his life is spent on the top of freezing cold Yorkshire moors or in freezing cold barns, dealing with horrible um, twisted intestines of horses. Sometimes he has to shoot a horse to put it out of its misery. And as we heard in the earlier passage, he might have to have his arm up a cow's bottom for two hours. It's not surprising that he loves visiting Mrs Pumphrey. So if there's time, I'll read you a bit more about James Harriet later. But I would now, I'm just going to take this off because it's too hot, like to read you a bit uh, about Dr. Doolittle, who is another famous vet in literature, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, either from films or from having read the books. So these are also a selection of books that I also recently rediscovered in my parents' bookshelves. And these date back to the 1940s. And actually, they were to be found in my grandparents' bookshelves before they went to live with my parents. And now here they are with me. So these, by the way, are the original versions which are unexpurgated. And we'll talk a bit more about why they were adjusted in the 1970s. So... Dr. Doolittle was written by Hugh Lofting in 1920 and the first book was called The Story of Dr. Doolittle. Dr. Doolittle is a physician initially who shuns human patients in favour of animals. So he starts off as a human doctor but gradually realises that he's going to be much better off being a, an animal doctor because he gets on much better with animals. He very handily has a parrot who teaches him how to talk to animals. The parrot is able to talk to him anyway because she's a very perspicacious parrot. But she teaches Dr. Doolittle the language of cats, horses, dogs, monkeys and every other creature that you can think of. He slowly, after becoming a vet also becomes a naturalist and he uses his abilities to speak with animals to better understand the natural world. He actually, um, Hugh Lofting first uh, wrote about Dr. Doolittle when he was writing letters to his children from the trenches during World War I, when the actual news, he said, was either too horrible or too dull. And the stories were set in Victorian England, where Dr. John Doolittle lives 
in the fictional English village of Puddleby on the Marsh in the West Country. So probably somewhere near Cheltenham, I'm guessing. Dr. Doolittle has a few close human friends, including Tommy Stubbins, Matthew Mugg, and the Cats Meets Man, which I always thought was a really sinister name for a person. I remember it as a child, finding it quite disturbing. I think it means he's the man that provides meat for cats, but quite a horrible name. Uh, in of his animal gang, he has Polynesia, the aforementioned parrot, Gub Gub, a pig, Jip, a dog, Dab Dab, a duck, Chi Chi, a monkey, Tutu, an owl, who's very clever and good at maths, and Push Me Pull You, who is the character that most people remember. Uh, and together they have many adventures. Going off to Africa is the first adventure, but they also visit the moon. And in all these lovely books, they do have many exciting and different adventures. The books do have a wonderful old-fashioned charm to them. They're still really great reads and they also have lovely illustrations. I don't know about the more modern versions but I do love these original illustrations which are slightly occasionally dubiously drawn but they still have a really wonderful aesthetic. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit from Dr. Doolittle to give you a flavour of the way he writes. And you'll see that he has a real simplicity about his writing, but they're also full of great adventures. Uh, Soon it became a common sight to see farm animals wearing glasses in the country round Puddleby, and a blind horse was a thing unknown. And so it was with all the other animals that were brought to him. As soon as they found that he could talk their language, they told him where the pain was and how they felt, and of course it was easy for him to cure them. Now all these animals went back and told their brothers and friends that there was a doctor in the little house with the big garden, who really was a doctor. And whenever any creatures got sick, not only horses and cows and dogs, but all the little things of the fields like harvest mice and water bowls, badgers and bats, they came at once to his house on the edge of the town, so that his big garden was nearly always crowded with animals trying to get in to see him. There's his big house. There were so many that came that he had to have special doors made for the different kinds. He wrote horses over the front door cows over the side door and sheep on the kitchen door. Each kind of animal had a separate door. Even the mice had a tiny tunnel made for them into the cellar where they waited patiently in rows for the doctor to come round to them. And so in a few years time every living thing for miles and miles got to know about John Doolittle MD and the birds who flew to other countries in the winter told the animals in foreign lands of the wonderful doctor of Puddleby on the Marsh, who could understand their talk and help them in their troubles. In this way, he became famous among the animals all over the world, better known even than he had been among the folks of the West Country, and he was happy and liked his life very much. However, he then runs out of money because uh, he, he acquires a crocodile from the local circus. The crocodile comes to live with him because He's having a much better time uh, living in his delightful world rather than the circus. Everyone gets scared and then they don't want to send their animals to him anymore. So he loses money. So then all the animals muck in and help and find their ways of uh, working around the house. The dog uses his waggy tail to clean the floor and the owl, who's very good with maths, starts doing the accounts and so on. Then they go off to Africa and in the original books it all gets rather dubious uh, with extremely dodgy racist remarks going on which were then expurgated in the 1970s version. So I believe the newer versions are much better and don't have the racist comments but the originals 
are quite shocking at times. So don't read the originals. Read the modernised versions because they have been rewritten to be um, much more acceptable. Uh, so we won't dwell on that. But Dr. Doolittle is a fantastic and brilliant vet in children's literature. There have also been the various adaptations to film over the years. Eddie Murphy starred in a 1998 version. And there's also the 2020 version with Robert Downey Jr. So that's a great children's book with uh, a vet being the hero. And we've talked a lot about James Harriet. I'd now like to mention a few other adult books with some great vets. So Karen Joy Fowler is a brilliant American writer who has written quite a few books of different genres, science fiction and uh, literary fiction. And one of her most famous books is We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, which isn't strictly speaking about a vet, but it is about a female animal scientist who does a really fantastically bizarre experiment on her family. And I don't want to tell you too much about it because I don't want to spoil the book. If you haven't read it, you must. It's a fantastic book with one of the best reveal moments that I've read in the last 10 years. And it does have really interesting discussions about the consciousness of animals, our attitude to animals and the way that we treat them. And she also wrote, while researching into this book, a very interesting short story called What I Didn't See, which you could read in probably less than half an hour, and you can actually find it online, which is something that she wrote after doing research about chimpanzees uh, for one of her books. And during her research, she came across an essay by Donna Haraway, which discusses a 1920s expedition carried out by the curator of the New York National Museum of History. When one of the men on the expedition wanted a woman in the group to kill a gorilla in order to ultimately protect the species. It's all highly dubious morally, but the reasoning in it, I think, is that he says, this is how he justifies it, if a woman kills the gorilla, then all the men won't want to travel all the way to Africa to kill a chimpanzee, because if a woman can do it, then why would they bother doing it? Because they're not going to get any kudos dodgy in every way but the story is about one of the women on the expedition and it's written in her eyes called What I Didn't See. Uh, it won the short story Nebula Award in 2003 and it is a really interesting story which brings up all kinds of interesting questions about animal consciousness and human responsibility to animals and the way that we treat animals and uh, act as if we own them. This is also explored in a more modern novel, um, Unsaid, by Neil Abramson, which was written in 2011, which is a really fascinating exploration of, again, animal rights, particularly relating to chimpanzees, but it's also very much about the consciousness of dogs, horses and cats. And it's about a vet called Helena who has died of breast cancer. And the whole book is written in her words from beyond the grave. So you do have to make quite a big leap to accept that in the book. And by the way, I will write down all these titles after this session so that you know what they are, because I don't have all of these books to hand to show you. But Unsaid actually has a really nice cover of a dog on the front looking at you very mournfully. And the story is about the vet observing the dead vet, observing her husband and seeing how he has 
he's now coping after her death with their three dogs, their horse, his legal practice, and most crucially, a chimpanzee again. So we do have a lot of chimpanzees in this evening of vet themed novels. Uh, the chimpanzee in this book called Unsaid is one who is taking part in an experiment which the dead vet's best friend was involved with. And this best friend was trying to uh, communicate with the chimpanzee using sign language and also using another system of uh, communication which involves the chimpanzee tapping keys on a keypad and in the book the chimpanzee is able to communicate as if she is a uh, has the same kind of intelligence as a four to five year old child and the book gets very much embroiled with the rights of this chimpanzee because the experiment is going on to a certain level but then it's stopped because one of the guys giving the funding doesn't believe in it because the chimpanzee will only communicate with the woman that it that is its chief carer it won't communicate with anyone else using sign language therefore the exp experiment seems to be null and void however the woman in charge of the chimpanzee experiment is very much um, invested in the chimpanzee emotionally and she becomes obsessed with rescuing the chimpanzee from a life of probable slavery and misery. And it does delve into a lot of depth about what's going to happen to that, that chimpanzee if it's not continuing in the communication experiment. It's probably then going to be injected with lots of unpleasant diseases such as hepatitis. And this obviously does still happen in real life in some countries. And the book, which is written by a lawyer, Neil Abramson, is all about the slowly evolving legal rights of animals, which is actually genuinely happening and improving constantly. And it was published in 2011. Things have changed since then. But it's a really fascinating novel um, on many levels because it's about the the woman who's the vet, who's the narrator. It's about her experience of being a vet, how she feels about all the various animals that she has helped, aided, and also had to help to die and put them out of their pain and suffering. So it's really interesting in terms of all of those issues. And it's quite a long and complex book and occasionally it does become a little bit sentimental but it is a great story and full of quite a lot of interesting undertones about animal rights. Another great book that I must mention is Jonathan Unleashed by Meg Rossoff. Uh, Meg Rossoff is one of my favourite authors. I love her novel How I Live Now which is one that I frequently recommend to bibliotherapy clients because it's such a mesmerising read. But Jonathan Unleashed is a very different book to that. It's a charming and hilarious novel about a young New Yorker's search for happiness and the two dogs who help him to find it. So this is more of a light and lovely, upbeat read uh, about uh, the main character, Jonathan Trefoil, whose boss is unhinged, his relationship is completely wrong for him, uh, his girlfriend wants to marry someone just like him, only richer and with a different sense of humour. He's highly confused by life, but then his brother asks him to look after his two dogs, just for a few weeks or maybe for six months, and he starts looking after the dogs and this slowly changes his life in lots of uh, entertaining and great ways. Could a Border Collie and a Cocker Spaniel hold the key to life, the universe and everything? Asks the author. Um, he basically starts taking them on their daily walks, taking them to visit the vet and the vet 
becomes a hugely important part of his life. And you can see where this is going on this theme of vets in literature tonight. So that's a funny, wise, romantic comedy set in Manhattan. So that would be a great one to read um, on a more upbeat note to some of the ones that I've mentioned so far. Um, although, of course, uh, James Harriet is highly upbeat and generally brilliant. So just a couple more to mention. Tiger by Polly Clark is another one which is not strictly speaking a vet novel, but it's about another woman researcher of animals who starts off researching primates. There do seem to be a lot of primate researchers in fiction who are mostly women, intriguingly. Um, her name is Frida. She's a sensitive, solitary primatologist or primatologist. Um, but then a violent attack shatters her ordered existence. She becomes a zookeeper and then she meets an injured wild tiger. And meanwhile, we have another part of the novel happening in the Siberian tiger, where a Russian conservationist fears that the natural order has top toppled when the king tiger has been killed by poachers and a spectacular tigress now patrols the vast territory of Siberia on her own. So this is a really interesting novel all about tigers and Polly Clark has been praised for entering into the consciousness of tiger tigers in a very believable way. So this is a really fascinating novel, which I think many of you animal lovers would greatly enjoy. It's not so much on the vet theme. So pulling back to vets for the last five minutes, another lovely novel is one called Once Bitten by Tim Marsh, which is a more recent vet novel on the same lines as James Herriot's All Creatures Great and Small, about Alan Rees, who is a trainee vet in Bridgeford in England, uh, who is a young veterinary surgeon at the dawn of the new millennium, who has a plan to save the world one animal at a time. But uh, as he goes on with his practice, he realises that he has far more enemies than he was imagining, apart from vicious pets, difficult owners, surly farmers, children from hell. He finds himself working with an unhinged and jealous surgeon who makes it his personal mission to ruin Alan's hopeful and optimistic plan of saving the world. So he then has to work hideously long hours, make life and death decisions, deal with tragic cases, uh, come up against a complaint from the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and get involved in an unexpected love triangle. So this is a really fun read, very much influenced by and admitting to loving uh, James Herriot. He actually says in his, in his preface that it was James Herriot that made him want to be a vet in the first place. So... Uh, that's a really lovely read. That's Once Bitten. And uh, I think on that happy note, I will leave it there with the veterinary books. But if anyone has any thoughts on vet books and vet ideas that you want to share with me, please do. I also put it out to the world to ask what do real vets like to read? And I think there are all sorts of answers. I did get one answer that uh, was from a lady whose daughter's a vet, who's reading a book called The Body Bears. I always forget the title of this book, even though I've got it myself. The Body Bears the Trauma, The Body Bears the Witness, something like that. It will come back to me and I'll put it on the... Um, I'll put it on the list of titles, but it's a book that I'm actually reading myself and it's all about the way that trauma becomes part of your body and 
the best way to heal it is to reconfront that trauma in a physical way. That's putting it in a very simplified fashion. And that's a subject that we can return to on another day. But I think real vets probably read a lot of fantastic books which are nothing to do with being a vet. And maybe because I imagine they have quite a stressful existence, they might want to read highly escapist literature. And although um, James Harriet is absolutely fantastic and highly escapist, maybe reading him is too much like a busman's holiday. So any vets out there, I'd love to hear from you about what you do like to read. Thanks so much for joining me this evening. I will see you next week. Good night.